Today's show is brought to you by Direction. Josh, do you, are you a breakfast guy? Oh my God, I eat two <laughs> breakfasts a day. Go on. We're here to talk about the Direction breakfast commodity strategy. Direction.com backslash lean hogs. <laughs> I just make that up. Go to Direction.com to learn more. 49! I thought it was 50. Why did I think it was 50? Because it's a year. We missed All three right. weeks. You guys, for, for one year anniversary, before I introduce our illustrious guest, I want to just thank everybody for listening for the last year. We started the show with the intention of seeing people that we like, hanging out again in person, no more Zoom, no more Skype, uh, no more conference call. Let's talk shop. Let's talk investing and markets and the economy with cool people who know things. Let's try to learn from them. Let's bring the audience into these conversations and let's have some fun. And so far, Duncan, have we accomplished this? What would I, you say? I'd say so, yeah. How many, what, what would you give us out of 10 on all of those things? I mean, I'm going to be optimistic. The answer is 10. Very yeah, good, I'm Duncan. Give 10. So in honor of our first year doing the show, um, we are doing a anniversary sale. Nicole, is that the right way to put it? Okay. Uh, the Compound Store, which you can find at idonshop.com. All of your favorite financial blogger merchandise is there. The Animal Spirits coffee mug, the Compound and Friends t-shirt and sweatshirt. What else do we have? Oh, we have beach towels. Uh, I'm long TR. It's official. You do, you Go just, on. All right, we'll get into that in a second. Michael's day trading as I, I do this. Anyway, 25% off through the weekend. That starts Friday at 9 a.m. until Sunday at 5 p.m. Buy whatever you want. 25% off. That's our gift to you guys uh, for being such amazing fans. Millions of downloads. Uh, so many nice comments, so many nice emails, DMs. We love you all. Okay, now for the really exciting news. We have Jason Shu in the house. Jason, say hello to everybody. Hello, everyone. All right. Uh, when did I? When did we meet you? You were with Research Affiliates. It's got to be 2017, 20. Oh, no. It's earlier than that. 14? It must have been 14, yeah. Okay. I look younger now, though, would you say? Oh, yeah. Is that it's accurate? And okay. hotter. For sure. Way hotter. Thank you. Look at this guy. Yeah, you, you went from being a money manager to like a, a DJ. <laughs> you're, already, you're, you're already winning. All right. Jason Shu is the founder, CIO, and portfolio manager at Radiant Global Advisors and a professor of finance at the UCLA Anderson School of Management. How long have you been doing the, the professor of, of uh, finance gig? Wow, since 2017. I've okay. been at UCLA since, oh, no, no, 2007. God, it's longer than that. It's and a I've long time. I've been at UCLA since 09. What's your favorite part about teaching as opposed to managing money and, and being a, a, an analyst? Uh, you're going to like this word. No conflict, right? Like, this is one of those few jobs where you and the client have zero conflict at all, right? And they're not worried about, hey, is my professor going to rip me off and tell me something wrong to help himself? And so it's an easy relationship. Okay. It's a great relationship. You okay. feel like you're truly helping. Maybe a potential conflict if the par if the parents don't like the grades that the kids are getting. <laughs> I don't know. but uh, No, but it's I, I'm with you on that. That's It's a very pure it's very versus pure. almost everything to do with finance that is not very pure. Yep. Uh, as hard as we try and as much as we'd like it to be. Okay, that's cool. And when did you found Radiant? 2016. Okay. What was the idea behind doing your own firm? Yeah, so obviously I came from Research Affiliates, a fabulous company. I started with uh, Rob Arnott shout back to in Rob. 02. Yep. Yeah, shout out to Rob. Yep. You know, guy who taught me almost everything I, I, I know today. Uh, so spinning out of Research Affiliates was about sort of seeing this opportunity, right? The rise of China, it's taking on a larger footprint with an MSCI. Uh, it's you know going to be as big as the U.S. in terms of the economy and certainly maybe over time as right. big as a capital market. So I thought, hey, you know, if there's a chapter two in this career, that that's that's where I like to sort of hang my shingle and okay. then ride that gray wave. So you are, so explain, all right, explain to me, explain to us exactly what, how you're capitalizing on that opportunity. What does Valiant Global Advisors do? Who does it do it for? Yeah. So, you know, our clients are still the same, right? We serve, you know, sort of global pension funds, uh, you know, global investors. Uh, now, the focus is more narrow, right? You know, back in research affiliates, we're, you know, investing your money for kind of U.S. large cap, global large cap. Right. But here it's much more targeted, looking at, you know, China emerging markets, of which, you know, China is almost half of that allocation. So right. very much kind of, you know, sort of China emerging Asia specialist. 
and uh, and we hope to be you know the guy you think about you know the guy you want to go talk to and 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 get guidance from and help you get access when you think about accessing China accessing sort of EM and making sure that your China allocation within EM makes sense. That, Jason, that's are, you doing, are you doing macro stuff or micro or both? Both. So all right, so let's get so let's get into that from a from a from a macro perspective. You're. And we're going to do a whole lot on the U.S., but just like really quickly, from a macro perspective, the way that you think about getting exposure to China is via uh, – or is based on things that are happening in the global economy or the Chinese economy. Like, What are the important things that you guys consider when you're building portfolios? I mean we, we definitely look at the world when we look at China because, look, it's so connected can't with the world. separate the two you things. You can't separate the two things, yeah. right? Uh, I mean they're part of the global value chain. And also just, just a lot of – Lessons you can learn from Japan, from Taiwan, South Korea, from even the U.S. during the days when there were lots of retail individuals in that market. So we try to learn from global markets and the history lessons from those markets and then applying it to China. Okay. And then on a, from a micro perspective, were there a lot of things that you learned at Research Affiliates about ranking stocks and trying to figure out like what areas of the market had more opportunity than others? I, I would imagine you're looking at valuation. Well, how, how are you doing that? Yeah, so I mean, the one thing I, I learned from research affiliates is, like, you know, alpha is zero sum, right? We all know that. And the more inefficient a market is, the more likely alpha is larger, and the more variety of you know sources of alpha, right? So it right. won't just be a value factor, maybe a bunch of other stuff that also works. And and you know that happens to hold well in 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 China, right? It's a very inefficient market. Like eighty five percent of all trades are from sort of retail individuals who are gambling instead of investing. And so sort of understanding the behavioral biases behind that is hugely important for creating alpha and then managing the portfolio. And so it's value factor works really well, and you know, low vol factor works well, a bunch of different quality factors, and then like idiosyncratic funny factors you com- as well. You're competing with a lot of money managers who understand or who employ those same lenses when they're looking at the market, or do you still have a lot of like room to yourself to do that kind of factor-based analysis? You know, the quant approach, the more academic approach, you know, that's – becoming more popular in the U.S. In China, it's very, very new, right? People are mostly sort of, you know, sharpshooter, okay. stock pickers. They got like six stocks in their portfolio. So I would say kind of, you know, green field for us there. So you can run up a killer, a killer like five-year track record doing that before anybody big moves in and takes those same factors you're looking for. And, yeah. And, okay. All right, cool. Love it. Uh, I want to pivot to the U.S. and I want to get into uh, inflation one of the things I read that you did recently was about stagflation. And I actually think this is like the number one debate among investors right now, not even just professionals. I think like everyone who has money in the market is consumed by, is the inflation going to go away? Is it going to become stagflation? We're gonna, right? Like this, it just yep. seems like, okay. Um, in the recovery from the last recession, we were all obsessed with unemployment data. And it was like non-farm payroll day was the the biggest market mover. Remember, Weisenthal used to tweet, yeah. like, eye twitches 30 uh, seconds before. You were there. I mean, we were all on Twitter, yeah. 829, yeah. the first Friday morning of every month, and that was the big thing that told us- For a while. Is the recovery really happening, right? Um, now, I, I know it's silly, like, in hindsight, but, like, every reporter, every economist, every trader, that was the thing. That that stopped being relevant after a while, Uh and then I think like you could do the same thing with COVID, get the numbers every week or we'd watch uh, Governor Cuomo was like <laughs> a leading indicator, whatever. Now it's CPI. Yep. So we're going to get a CPI report next week uh, on the 10th. I don't know what day of the week that is, maybe Friday of, ne- of next week. Uh, but this is the thing now. So I wanted to ask you what your thoughts were about just the way markets seem to be tolerating uh, the inflation and what your overall view is on on the current situation. Yeah, I mean, first of all, I mean, our markets are so driven by headlines, right? So, you know, everyone's writing yeah. about inflation, so market has only that headline to react to. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, I imagine headline numbers are going to be intransigent for a long time because, sure, you know, the printing of money has a long-term effect on inflation, but right now, the shock rise in prices, right? It's disruption in China due to a COVID lockdown, right? It's the war you know, in uh, Ukraine uh, that's causing energy and food prices to spike up. Like, 
that's not going to go away anytime soon, even though China sort of easing. So that might happen a few quarters from now in terms of relieving inflation pressures. But in, in the meantime, whatever the Fed's sort of doing in the background, that's going to take quarters, maybe even longer for that to play out. Uh, so it's going to be intransigent. I think people are going to continue to be freaked out by it. You seem really pessimistic about the Fed's ability to even affect it. Yeah. I mean, look, I mean, what does the rate hike do to the war in Ukraine? Right? What does the rate hike do to the crazy COVID lockdown policy in Shanghai. Nothing. Well, I guess they're thinking that they can maybe cool off demand. But is your point, like the case for stagflation, is that we can have a slowdown, maybe contraction. But if crude oil keeps rising, yeah. that's it. Yeah. I mean, we demand could fall. But if crude oil is trading as 120 bucks a barrel, right, like that's not going to fall just because our demand is weaker. The Fed can affect the, Fed can affect the, the labor market and housing. Yep. If, I feel like those are the two – Primary, primary things that they can do. So that's why they focus on core PCE, for example. But wait, what about what about stock prices? Because just with the Fed speaking, they've killed stock prices, and that is starting to impact the economy. We're seeing layoffs all over the place. Well, that's how I think they do it. So they can affect, so they can affect housing, they can affect um, the labor market via stock prices. what they do to financial conditions, right. which are stock. stock prices, credit availability, and I don't know, whatever Real else. Estate, you know. yeah. And then Josh, you're right. right? Like, but that... You imagine, right? That's a really painful way to solve a problem, right? Like, it's ultimately inflation is a problem, but it's it's a problem within the context of many other problems, right? You can say, okay, do I want to deal with higher prices or do I want to deal with my wealth being cut by a third? And what if we could have both at the same time? <laughs> yeah, right? yeah. Yeah. You could have high prices and be poor by 30%. Yeah, you could so have. that that seems to be where the pessimists now think we're headed. I, like my guess is that stagflation is like possible, but probably can't last for a long time. Because if people don't feel wealthy, they stop spending, which eventually is going to hit the inflation part, right? So I, how long could we live in stagflationary conditions? What, it, what does history say? What's realistic if, if that's in fact where we're headed? But it's all oil, no? Isn't that it? I would say because uh, you can't have you can't have consumer prices continue to correct. rise with with a with a recession. So you know it's a lot of the external stuff um, that's going to be sort of transitory. Uh, you know, oil prices. I mean, how long is the war going to stay uh, on? And then you know, what will what will the Middle East do? Uh, so those sort of external shocks are viewed as sort of transitory, and of course, transitory could be two years, right? Yeah. Uh, but the stuff like you say, Michael, um, that's caused by sort of wealth effect, easy money. Um, that as long as you sort of cool off the money supply and take away credit, so that's going to fix itself. So like but, services, right? That's purely driven by by wealth, by people correct, spending. Correct. Like uh, airlines prices are not going to keep going up if people stop booking vacations. Correct. We're right. asking a lot of the Fed though. Um, we're we're asking them cool off inflation with, but slow, not too much. Slow the economy, but not to the point where it, it bothers hurts. anybody. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're trying to thread the needle, and then. And then let's buy ourselves enough time until the Ukrainian thing sorts itself out and Shanghai completely reopens. And yeah. I don't know how much time those two things require. Nobody does. It seems to be it's a hell thinking. of a tough dance that uh, that they got to make this work. Okay. Uh, so, but so you're more in the camp that stagflation is inevitable. Uh, yeah, but I'm in in your camp as well. Uh, the minute we get into stagflation and the Fed gets you know sort of a new mandate, which is look, you know. Sure, prices are high, but we understand there are a lot of things out of your control. Uh, focus on growth, right? Make it a little easier. Uh, then they can start to cut rates. So where do they need inflation? Go, where, where do they need inflation to be in order to make that shift and say, okay, now we're back to being worried more about growth? Uh, I think they will find an angle where <laughs> it's either, oh wait, the slope has flattened, right? So you know we got peak inflation okay. rather than break even inflation. Because right now I think the target maybe let's get the break even inflation. But I think at some point they're going to declare some kind of victory, and say it's under control. That's focus on growth. That's okay. focus on credit. So 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 next week's CPI report. I know the Fed is it looks at PCE, but whatever. Let's assume they're correlated enough. Next week's uh, consensus estimate is eight point one. That's versus I think eight point five was. And that's the last what Europe, Europe came in at eight one or eight two. So let's say it's below eight one. Doesn't that give them room to be like, okay, what we're doing is working. We're going to keep doing it, but this is not going to go on forever because eventually we're going to win. Like I don't think they're going to say it that we, way. We, but we keep getting upset surprises. Yeah, and and that's because right now there's really no correlation between what the Fed's doing 
and really kind of these headline numbers, right? And so if it goes our way, it's dumb luck. Yeah. Um, but of course, the rest of the market doesn't think that way. They, they hope there's some correlation. So when we're surprised to the wrong side, we've kind of have the story, the Fed's lost control and that freaks out the market when we really can't take any more freaking out. What's the point of view from, uh, f- what's the point of view from uh, emerging markets from China about Europe, the UK, and now the US Federal Reserve trying to fight inflation? Like what's what they they're they're on the outside looking in at all this. What what do you what do you think is going through their heads? Well, I think for them, uh, because they are the many factors, right? You you think of China as one of the biggest factories, but so are most Asian economies. They're big exporters, right? right. So for them, this is great news, right? Because uh, part of the solution of reducing prices is you got to trade more, right? You got to import more, and uh, and and so you know stronger dollar, uh, sort of. You know, weaker currency for the exporting countries. That's a great. That's a, that's a great outcome for them. Yeah. There's stronger demand. Maybe the tariff for Chinese goods are going to come down. So I think a lot of the Asian economies are looking at this as a really phenomenal opportunity. Right. So they're they're in a better position than we are. Their currency is weaker. They can export and make more money. And um, and we are not going to complain about the trade deficit because we actually want these cheap goods to come in and help contain right. prices for us. But they're also big consumers of oil and, and energy, so that might be the that might be something that they're not so thrilled with. Yeah. So obviously they're going to pass through um, the cost, and they are in in charge, right? Because if if we weren't so fixated on inflation, their ability to pass through the the extra cost might be lower. But because we are, I think they're in the driver's seat, right? Uh, they can pass through all the costs, and they can probably expand on the margin a little bit. Joe Biden uh, has some of the lowest approval ratings for a second-year president in the history, maybe, of them keeping records. Uh, he did an op-ed for the Wall Street Journal, which obviously is not friendly ground for uh, most Democratic presidents. They turned the comment uh, section off, by the way, for this. Yeah, I would Like, I literally. Have. Did they really? <laughs> yeah, look. <laughs> uh, good idea. Okay. Uh not what, what do you think about Joe Biden's policies, but any policy. Is there anything that the president from the top down uh, position can actually really do here other than just say we're going to support the Fed, which is one of his – he's got like three things that he wants to do. He says he wants to uh, improve infrastructure, which sounds pretty generic, yeah. but maybe do more onshoring and therefore have more supply available of things. That sounds like it's going to take a long time. <laughs> it's not going to fix our problem right now. <laughs> okay, good. How about a, but how about the housing supply action plan? Wait, wait. Re, uh, reduce the federal deficit, which I'm not, not really sure what that's not about. Sure what that has to do with inf- inflation? But all right, this is Biden. We need to keep reducing the federal deficit, which will help ease price pressures. Uh, how? Maybe because the government is buying way too much stuff. I I don't know. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right, fine. Uh, second, we need to take every practical step to make things more affordable for families. We can't let up our global effort to punish Mr. Putin for what he's done. Good luck with that. Uh, but he's talking about releasing oil reserves, the largest release from global oil reserves in history. That's like um, drop in a bucket. I was gonna right. I was gonna say a drop of water in an ocean. Uh, that that's your read on that too. Yeah, I mean, uh, we we probably. Uh, would be better served by you know making a trip out to the Middle East and sweet talking OPEC into helping out because OPEC is not playing ball. Yeah, and then the and then the main thing is uh, my predecessor demeaned the Fed. Past presidents have sought to influence its decisions inappropriately during periods of elevated inflation. I think President Johnson put pushed the guy up against the wall physically. <laughs> Uh, I read. Okay. So he's like, I'm not going to do that. Uh, We've appointed highly qualified people. I'm going to let the Fed do what the Fed does. That's probably the most realistic thing that he said. I think that's very sensible, right? If you hire smart people, let them do the job, right? It's a very hard job. It's hard enough without, you know, a lot of politics getting involved. I sometimes think of like what Trump would be doing in high (laughs) inflation, uh, like how he would be tweeting about this. Prices are so beautiful. Beautiful, beautifully high prices. Bigly. (laughs) All right, prices have never been higher. There's not there's not much though that any president really could do in this situation, right? Yeah, I mean, look, a lot of those external shocks. I mean, sure, we could reduce tariffs on on imports, right? That's going to help a little bit. Uh, but um, beyond that, uh, we can't lower oil prices, right? Because that's a international market. You now we again could sweet talk OPEC into helping out a little bit. Um, but yeah, not a whole lot. Maybe we can improve our relationship with China and send them free vaccines. Okay. <laughs> That, that would help, you think? 
Oh, that might. Okay. <laughs> but rather than complete lockdowns. Yeah. Might be, okay. Um, would they take it or they would want to put a wrapper on it that says it's they, they were partly involved in oh, developing it? Yeah. I mean, it. for sure, we, we, okay. we, we got to right. understand that face thing, right? So it's got to be like, we have this friendly scientific collaboration and the yes. Chinese have contributed a lot of the IP into this better vaccine that's now yes. co-developed. But, but again, you know, whatever we do for humanity. So yeah. me- meanwhile, um, the job market is still red hot. Demand for workers, eleven. Po- there's 11.4 million job openings in April. So here's a quote from the chief economist of ZipRecruiter. Employees continue to have unprecedented job security. Yeah. Unprece- Overall layoffs are down 37%. From pe- from pre pandemic, unprecedented levels. job security sounds good. Why aren't people happier? And this is this is actually the funny stuff, right? Like, like, look, if inflation is because your wage has gone up and your wage going up makes costs of making everything higher, like you're kind of no worse off, right? So I think people focus on prices high as bad, uh, and whatever you do to reduce price uh, as good, right? Well, what if? Well, what if we go go in and today and say we're going to cut minimum wage, we're going to put a cap on salaries, uh, and that will reduce prices, right? I think that'd be a really stupid solution. So I think people have got to be a little bit more multidimensional when they think about prices being high. The higher. typical worker is like, "Hey, I'll take my job flexibility and my current w- wage of 2022, but I would like to transport them back to the the environment of 2019." Yeah, that would be like a great, oh, be a heard, great situation. I heard a crazy stat today. I think this came from from LinkedIn. One in twenty jobs is from people returning to their previous employer. So remember the Great Resignation. Yeah. I think we're we're on the other side of that. People are like, take me back, take me back. John, throw up this chart. So when I graduated in two thousand and eight, there was like getting a job was no joke. Like it was really difficult, uh, especially when you uh, had the resume that I did. But that's neither here nor there. Look at <laughs> look look. Did you interview with Jason? <laughs> <laughs> look where we are today. Look at this. So we're looking at the openings rate relative to the labor force, and the bottom line is there are just so many jobs. Wait, can you explain to me what this means? Se- what is seven percent? Seven percent what? Openings rate, so job opportunities. So I guess that's eleven point four million divided by the labor force. So if you want a job, you could you could get a job. So it, this is twenty years, and we are looks like triple the average. What's the average? It looks like, it, it, it's been it's been between three and four percent basically forever. Wow. Yeah, if you're graduating right now, this is a great time. Are you're in a driver's seat. Are you having trouble finding people? Oh yeah, you are. Uh, it, it, it is. How hard. many people have you hired so since you started the firm? Uh, we probably hired 20 plus people. How many in the United States? All? Uh, uh, half of that, at least. Half. Yeah. Okay. What, so what do you, what, like, you're looking for PMs or analysts or? Yeah, across the board. Operations people, you know, business okay. people. Okay. So you've got to think that at some point soon, the power will shift from uh, labor to employer. So I, th- I actually. Goes in cycle. I think that's already happening. Like well, we're seeing layoffs. We just haven't seen the other side of this yet. Well, this data is April. April. So this morning we got ADP, and that's private payrolls. And there's usually a very high correlation uh, between private payrolls and just the overall labor situation. And it was the weakest month of hiring since the start of the recovery from the pandemic. It was 128,000 new private payrolls added. Not surprising, right? Um, what's interesting is small businesses actually had net negative 90,000 jobs. So small businesses ah, are great resignation. They're, they're the great unresignation. They're going they back. Can't, to, they're going if, back to Google, dude. If you're a small, if you're a small business, tough, and, Wal- and Walmart is hiring, right yeah. Yeah. how are you going to compete on benefits, hourly pay, going back to the giants, flexibility? It's really, really hard. Uh, also, information technology companies uh, had net negative minus two thousand jobs. It's three about months, time. Three months in a row. <laughs> So a lot of people are looking at the NASDAQ who, who manage technology companies and they're saying, oh, that's my cue. We're, in, we're playing defense now. But we, we, we said that for the first time in basically ever, uh, labor has the upper hand. And it lasted, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm maybe it's premature to call the top, but it lasted for like six, eight months. Yeah, I mean, look, I mean, you know, the big employers, the tech sector, right? Uh, their currency for hiring people, you know, stock options, uh, stock. So that's not so attractive anymore, right? A lot of people are underwater. They got to go yeah, figure yeah, out how but, to recycle Jason, that. but compare that to the subprime startups <laughs> and it's looking pretty attractive. You, yes. would take, you would take Apple stock options. At uh, this point? Relative to yeah. 
uh, uh, other choices that yeah. you might have. Yeah. Is that an underreported phenomenon? How much money, paper money, has disappeared in the form of stock-based compensation at startups? That's got to be a lot of money that no longer oh, yeah. is being paid now. Oh, yeah. I mean, I mean, there's a lot of wealth that's sort of disappeared or been destroyed, right? So when we're talking about you're fighting inflation by hiking up prices, but what they're not talking about is, of course, the mechanism is through hiking up you know, rates, uh, prices for all risky assets fall. So a lot of wealth's been destroyed. And again, like if that's the medicine to bring prices down, you got to think about, do I want to take that medicine? I heard about a crazy down round uh, today, and we're, we're, we're going to start to see that like in droves. And what that does is it definitely take it definitely plays a part in cooling the economy because the wealth, in my opinion, the wealth effect, real estate and stocks – really is a huge driver of the economy, even in places that you wouldn't expect it. And it's hard to quantify this, but like, you know, you might have the personal trainer come an extra day a week if your stock price is at all time highs. Forget about buying the second home or whatever. There are people buying second boats yeah. from from like the stock market that we've experienced over the last few years. And then you have the average home price up 20% in two years. All of that feeds into the strength of the economy, and it's got to work in reverse. It can't only work in one direction. Absolutely. Right. So that's yeah. the Fed getting what, it's want, what it yeah. wants, though. I mean, that's the proof that the Fed matters, right? It can create wealth, and through creating wealth, get people to spend more money, drive consumer growth, drive inflation. It could do the other direction. But it can't magically do it, right? It's got to destroy wealth in the, in the process. So you and I and Michael, we're all sitting in the, in the middle of that mechanism that does that, <laughs> basically. Right. What, YouTube? Close. Uh, all right. So, so I wanted to get into uh, year to date um, stock markets and what's working, what's not. We're before we, hold on, before we get okay. to all this, can Please. I just say, is is this strike anybody as? And maybe this is just you know a bounce or whatever. But like, we're only th and I know it's the S and P and a lot of pl places are completely bombed out. But the S and P is only thirteen percent off the highs. I know. Why are we so bearish for down thirteen percent? Well, I think sentiment uh, is horrendous right now. Yeah, I think we're so bearish because we kind of feel like we're due. We're due for a correction. And we're thinking correction may be minus 25%, minus 30%. So when S&P is only down 13, we feel like maybe there's 20 more to go. Yeah, it but does feel that but, way. But don't, we, but don't we like almost kind of know that a recession is coming or is am I being overly gloomy? Like, can we can we skirt a recession? Now, I, I think most everyone who's sort of in the know follows enough of sort of news and gurus will go, yeah, it's it's coming. You Wait, know, don't it's point to me and say year. guru. <laughs> well, the yield curve inversion was how long ago? Six weeks? Uh, yeah. The twos, tens. All right, so the countdown clock started historically. It's, it's been right like 20 times in a, in a row. So it's probably- It's coming. It's, yeah. Okay, it's coming. But so far this year, there have actually been some places to hide or at least some outperformance. So I wanted to go through- what usually works in high inflation kind of worked this time. Like it, if you knew the playbook, you were sort of okay. Uh, if you could have looked at what worked in the 1940s and 1970s and run all the same plays, and you sort of would have been fine. So small cap value did better than large cap growth. Um, value minus growth overall was was a home run. John, well, throw, well, up, throw, up, throw up JC's charts. So on the top is small cap growth divided by small cap value. Mm -hmm. Sorry, guys. It's at a four-year low. Large cap growth divided by large cap value is at a two-year low. So it's more pronounced in small caps, like pretty dramatically so. Is that global or is that just happening in oh, the US? That's been, that's been global. And uh, I don't know how much of that is sort of you know value stock and their sensitivity to, to rates and inflation, but it's certainly been kind of growth sensitivity, particularly small growth sensitivity to cost of capital and to kind of a generally optimistic forecast and sentiment, right? So a lot of small cap growth is purely story driven, right? right. Once you take the optimism away, the story falls apart. Well, those got hammered. I think that, I think that, I think that fell 40% almost. At least. So the, cha the challenge with stuff like this is how long can you stay in business as your value manager? <laughs> like how, how long can you tell your clients to calm down when they're comparing you to Microsoft, Amazon, Apple, uh, you must have some great stories about meetings where you're just like if people are watching three year numbers and they just they can't believe they're not participating more. Look, this is a good chart. So we're looking at percent off high. The orange line are zero coupon bonds 
and the purple line is small is a small cap growth, and it tracks. Yeah. These are these are the longest duration stocks. So what, yep. so what are you telling people about asset allocation now? Does this does this have legs? This value versus growth thing. Uh, for a while, I mean, it's always cyclical, right? Yeah. And it's less about how much time do you spend in value and growth. It's just how sharp are these movements? And look, I mean, value's gotten all of its sort of you know shortfalls back in a very short period of time. Uh, is it going to persistently outperform growth? Probably not. Uh, you know, the minute I think we officially hit recession and the Fed's got a new mandate to ease and help, you're going to see a growth cycle again. I didn't okay. listen to this yet, but Demoterin was on Patrick O'Shaughnessy's podcast talking about how the old playbook of inflationary stocks, he's like, not that materials, you know, uh, energy stocks aren't going to work, but he thinks the cash cows, the, the FANG stocks, excluding Netflix, are going to be the new inflation plays. Any firm that's got a strong cash flow and a lot of it right now, uh, you know, they aren't as impacted by, you know, discount rates, right? Because they got cash right now. They don't. They don't need to sell a story of oh, you know, twenty years from now I'll be cash flow positive and pay you a dividend, right? Because they actually pay dividend now. They got a lot of cash, can do buybacks. So I think a lot of the things, they're not really growth stocks anymore, right? I mean, they're I think, just great yeah. businesses. The truth of the matter is, an inflation. Like if we get an inflationary rack recession, like all these stocks are going to get hammered, right? Some maybe, maybe some less than others. But I guess I would think that like Apple is such a discretionary name that if we see, and we haven't really seen a slowdown in Apple since like Samsung was threatening in like 2013. It's been like a long time of just n uninterrupted expansion for Apple. I, yeah. I think Apple's biggest problem is China. Yeah, I, I agree. Right? But like, you know way more than I do about that. Why do you think so? Well, uh, look, uh, consumption in China is slowing down. Now, it may be temporary, but sure, temporary in China could be a year, a year and a few quarters before it sort of comes back due to the COVID lockdown and so on and so forth. And pent up demand might take a while to sort of, you know, uh, play out. Uh, so that's one risk. And the other one is, look, if U.S. continues to have this adversarial relationship with China, at some point, U.S. brand will start to lose its luster. Right? Yeah. There's going to be some nationalism that creeps into the consumer thinking, and they might say, hey, I'm going to buy a Huawei, a local brand, right, or a Xiaomi, or a Korean brand, where they're a bit more friendly to sort of the Chinese culture. I was going to say, like, the American companies that have the most exposure to that kind of... Uh turn in public sentiment toward U.S. brands, probably Apple number one. Absolutely. Nike number two. I'm thinking like Kentucky Tesla's Fried big. Chicken. Or, Kentucky Fried Chicken. Right. They're just so big there. What's going on with uh, lockdowns in in China? Like, And if that is lifted, is it not going to even put more pressure on crude oil? Uh, yeah. So, I mean, once the factories go full on, 100% uh, capacity, the energy usage is going to come back on. So that's going to add pressure, right? So while it released some pressure in terms of, sort of goods you know, coming from China to the shores of America, right? Uh, but the, 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 the pressure on all the energy that's needed to run factories, uh, that, will, that will be pushed up. So off net-net, it's, it's going to have a, a price reduction effect. Um, but I think you know, crude oil is going to continue to face sort of upward pressure. You know the, the charts of like the cost of freight from Shanghai to LA, yeah, has that eased up? Nah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was what? Like a few years ago, it was like 2,000 bucks to send a container back. Uh, now it's uh, close to 20,000, right? So that's- What is what is the thing that 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 moves that? Like what is the uh, the fulcrum? Is it energy prices or energy just Energy prices part, um, ports. Ports are so jammed up, the cost of getting, you know, sort of port workers, uh, to work both in Shanghai and in and, and Long Beach, that's gone up a lot. Uh, yeah. So it's it's both, right? Okay. It's, it's what the people and what's the energy. What solves that? Just paying higher rates for people or just people wanting to work more than they do right now? Uh, you got to get a lot more people to want to take those jobs. It's that simple. Yeah. Why can't we just replace everybody with robots? Uh, we what's, sure are trying. What's, <laughs> taking, what's taking so long? What's taking so long? Uh, I want to ask you about interest rates. How much does... Uh, the level of interest rates or how much do interest rate expectations factor into the way that you guys invest or how little do, do they factor in? No, uh, it, it matters a lot, right? I mean, it's one of the biggest sort of macro variables that enter into asset pricing, right? Okay. So everything we're trying to sort of, you know, value, right? This discounted cash flow approach is predicated on discount rate, which is predicated on, on the interest rate. Do you so, think, did we underestimate, like it sounds so obvious and lame saying this out loud, but did we underestimate just how impactful free money was to everything. We did, because 
people like taking credits for things they don't do, right? Like, so stock market goes up, you know, we're all amazing investors when in fact it's just the Fed re reducing thing. discount rate. <laughs> okay, go on, go on. <laughs> and so, so we don't want to fess up to, look, it's just sort of money illusion created by our government, right? We instead say it's amazing innovation, it's just everything that's good and awesome about capitalism, about U.S. economy. Uh, now it's being taken away. We blame it. Oh, this is all discount rated. The Fed's messing with the economy, right? Well, should... Although there what? Although earnings for the largest U.S. technology companies exploded higher in the last decade, like that part is undeniable. And the other part, is, part we, is true. The other part, in terms of like not just being complete maniacs, is that we had these companies go from zero to a billion dollars revenue faster than we ever had. And it wasn't like one or two companies. There was like a lot of them. Now we took it way too far with valuations, <laughs> but there was like. Crazy innovation and earnings growth and or sales growth, at least. I mean, we do we, we do we do want to give credit where it's due, right? So if you look, if you decompose, you know, stock price appreciation, uh, a good fifty percent of that is really top line and bottom line growth. The other fifty percent was multiple, multiple expansion, right? Yeah. So so yes, there's definitely growth, and of course, some of that growth came from cheap money, right? Like if you have low cost of capital and easy capital, you can take more risk, right? You can build more, do more R and D, hire people. You can you can just take but, more. But risk. Jason, if we deconstruct the areas in which that was happening. All of the expansion in non-profitable tech was obviously multiple expansion. <laughs> but with the overall, like with the S&P, it was earnings growth. It wasn't all multiple expansion. That's it's right. not like, like earnings for, uh, multiples for large cap stocks were reasonable. Actually in 21, they spent the whole year coming down. So in tw 21, we had 20% growth for the S&P 500. And I think multiple all contracted all year. Yeah. So, so I mean, I think, 2021, you start to see a lot of the smarter money in the market saying, look, if if growth rate, you know, doesn't catch up, I'm not gonna pay a higher multiple. Yeah. And and so you're sort of seeing that rolling over in 2022, which is you now we're seeing some slowdown and people now forecasting, you know, multiple contraction and bam, right? That just cascaded. Yeah. So we're probably 18 times forward earnings now, which is obviously historically not cheap, but for the Much post pandemic, <laughs> right? For the post pandemic era, it's it's downright but inexpensive. If we get inflation and a recession, that's that's still too high. That's right, because you know, obviously, you know, P's come down, right? But there's a risk that E could come down over the next few quarters. And when they both come down at the same time, seventies. That's that's where you get like a almost like it feels like a free fall in markets. Oh yeah. oh yeah, because stocks are falling and yet not getting cheaper. That's right. And so now we've got the Fed starting in June. Well, they're going to allow $17.5 billion to mature every month without reinvesting. In September, it's going to be up to $35 billion. So that's How do you think about the taper and, and uh, the, the reduction in the Fed's balance sheet? What, what, what do you think that does globally? What do you think that does to U.S. stocks? Well, I mean, it's going to continue to take liquidity, take easy money away. And so we know that's bad for risk assets. I just, right? I just sold TARC. Yeah, so <laughs> <laughs> Mike just sold the thing that he bought at the beginning of the podcast. How'd it go? Stop. This is a long term trade. There's like a three day trade for me. <laughs> okay. Continue. Uh, so, you know, I think we're probably a little too early for, you know, buy on dips, right? You know, and, and any rally may be more like a relief rally than anything else because, look, you know, there's the risk of E falling, right? So when price fall and E is falling, it doesn't feel like it's a good deal yeah. yet. Uh, so all of that, I think, you know, hanging in the backdrop, you know, and the Fed is probably unlikely to deviate from a committed path, right? If it sees, hey, it's working, inflation is coming down, uh, let me keep doing the same, right? If it says, hey, inflation is going up, they might step it up a bit more. So there's not a lot of sort of good news on the horizon. Right. Uh, well, yeah, I, got, I, I, I got a silver lining, silver lining. All right, John, throw up this next chart. So what we're looking at is, all right, only 4% of high yield bonds and loans mature in 2022 and 2023 because there was such a refinancing boom in 20 and 21, which is good. By the way, S&P Global, I think they suspended their guidance because there's such a lack of, of, of bonds to rate. Like, did you see that uh, yesterday? That's a, yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> I didn't realize that was the reason why. S&P Global doesn't have enough bond issues to rate to make their numbers. Right. <laughs> Okay, because why would you sell bonds now if you sold a ton of bonds last so, year, the year before? Addition, you don't have to. More good news is the chart on the right, we're looking at short-term debt uh, as a percentage of total debt, and it's come down like dramatically. So it's not as if companies are going to be exposed to higher rates next year because they gorged, and a lot of it is long-term debt. Short, okay, so short-term debt 20 years ago was about 20% of the debt market. It's a lot. Is that what we're saying? 
and now it's under 10. So, so, so companies were much more sensitive to fluctuations in interest rates. Michael, you're right. Like this time, it's going to be very, very different versus say, you know, 08, right? 08 was really a deleverage crisis. 08 was a full-blown liquidity crisis. Yeah. That's this not time, what this I think, is. Yeah, this time, a lot of firms that had cash flow that could issue debt, they were strategic, right? They saw the, 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 the Fed singling, right? And, and they went out and they fully immunized you know, their capital structure, which is very smart. So I don't think we're going to have like a liquidity-induced, you know, bankruptcy-driven type of a market collapse. What we have here is just a revision because discount rate's gone up. Multiple has to shrink. It's sort of a So hopefully it's just like a financial asset recession it's and a not, a, not a deep Main Street recession. So, right. Because you, if you have a le- – first of all, can you even have an actual technical recession if there are 11 million open jobs? Like, is it even possible? If uh, everybody who wants to work can work. Dude, things get weird. <laughs> things are weird. Things right. are weird. Things are weird. So here, here's what S&P said. They said, S&P Global is suspending financial guidance for the full year 2022. Macroeconomic conditions have deteriorated uh, since we last provided financial guidance on May 3rd, 2022. So that's a month ago. Negatively impacting the company's expectations for GDP growth and debt issuance volumes. Given the volatility and uncertainty in the issuance environment, the company cannot affirm its previously <laughs> issued guidance. No more debt. Bullish, <laughs> super bullish. But okay. I mean, going back to Josh's point, right? Like we could have this weird situation where you could find jobs, right? So you don't feel, you know, like poor because you, you're out of the job. Yeah. But it's the other part that's hitting you, right? It's not the income effect. It's the wealth effect. It's like, I have my jobs, but I'm going to have to work really hard to replenish or, all my portfolio losses. Or I have my job, thank God, but I'm starting to put monthly expenses on a credit card because of how high my expenses are. Yeah. And I never thought I would have to do that. But like my rent, my, my, my new lease for my apartment just jumped 5% for no reason. Well, like you, things like that. You know what else this might impact? One of the biggest stories of last year was the ultra wealthy using margin, right? Because they didn't want to sell their stocks, pay all the gains. So that now the loan to values were like normal. They weren't like, you know, stupid, but still that might, that, that might appear in, in the journal in a couple of months. Yeah. Uh, corporate zombies are, are a thing that's coming back. So uh, this is, let's say, I think this is Bloomberg. They are America's corporate zombies, companies that aren't earning enough to cover their interest expenses, let alone turn a profit. From meme stock favorite AMC Entertainment <laughs> to household names such as American Airlines and Carnival, their ranks have swelled in recent years, comprising roughly a fifth of the country's 3,000 largest publicly traded companies and accounting for about $900 billion of debt. Is this a sideshow, or is this something we should keep our eye on? This is a sideshow. Yeah, I, I, I sure hope so. Um, I don't think we're going to go the way of the Japanese economy, where like most of the firms are like an extension of the government, right? They're not profitable, but they can't go under because they hire so many people, so yeah. they're flooded with cheap debt to stay alive. I, I don't think we go that direction. This I is saw, temporary. I saw a chart this week looking at uh, interest interest uh, rate coverage ratios. And I can't remember if it was, I think it was a total market and we're fine. Like more than fine. Like companies are, are more than able to ca- to pay the debt that they carry. Uh, Jamie Dimon this week had had w- w- entertained us a little bit. What did we say last week? What did he say? Well, last, last week, week he's like, if there's a hurricane, I would tell you. Oh, yeah. And right told, now it's just storm clouds. He told us. <laughs> and then this week he's like, oh no, it's a hurricane. What's this? Read the quote. <laughs> so Jamie's doing weather now. Um, here's what he said, quote, it's a hurricane. Everyone thinks the Fed can handle this. That hurricane is right out there, down the road, coming our way. We just don't know if it's a minor one or Superstorm Sandy. That's oddly specific. Uh, you don't want to hear the CEO of America's largest bank talking about hurricanes, right? Just generally well, speaking. It's not just him. The CEO of Wells Fargo said, uh, as the Fed raises interest rates to some inflation, we do expect the consumer and ultimately businesses to weaken. Great. Here's a quote from uh, Ted Pick, Morgan Stanley's co-president. This paradigm shift at some point will bring in a new cycle because it's been so long since we've had to consider what a world is like with real interest rates, real cost of capital that will distinguish winning companies from losing companies. If the banks are sounding the alarms, it's generally not not what you want wouldn't, to say. Yeah, but wouldn't you wouldn't you say, holy shit, these guys are actually prepared for a financial crisis? Like they're actually talking about it before it happens. Much better than right. afterward. Saying, isn't that isn't that oh. better? <laughs> yeah, I would almost rather them be wrong, but just having it on their mind. Just think about those three. What banks. was Dick Fultz saying in 07? Oh, don't worry about it. 
Don't worry about it. But the guy from City was saying when the music's playing, That's you right. have to dance. That's right. Okay. None of these guys are talking like that now. Right. So they have the muscle memory news, right? from, from that experience. <laughs> Thank goodness. Ten years, not too long for people to forget. You pay much attention to macro forecasts or or things that uh, corporate uh, chiefs have to say or, or not really as oh, an investor. Totally, right. You do. Uh, totally. Because sometimes they're great contrarian indicators, right? If anything, contrarian. It's, it's a good measurement of sentiment. So I don't want to say contrarian. That's kind of mean, but it's a good measurement of sentiment. And I don't we know- think Jamie Dimon's listening to this, but okay. <laughs> well, you know whose sentiment is completely washed out? Like venture capitalists this week are like freaking the f- out. They're like, cut everything, batting down the hatches. You better have three years of runway. Yeah, that, that, that's true. Yeah. That, and that's not contrarian because they're the people giving out the money. <laughs> right. So right. if they're telling you, yeah, you don't, want to don't expect more money, you don't want there's to nothing that. contrarian about you that. You don't want to fade that. Yeah. So so I would say I, if I pay attention to what everyone else is saying because it just sort of tells you uh, what is pricing the market right now, right? Mm. And it's just sort of good to know, is it fear pricing the market or is it greed pricing the market? If it's fear pricing the market, you kind of go at least, you know, it could make sense that I want to start to reallocate and earn some risk premium, right? Because there's actually going to be some risk premium. Sure, there's risk, but there's certainly risk premium. Yeah. If it's greed pricing the market, right? Like, like you mentioned, then the like, opportunities are shrinking. Yeah. Like when everyone says it's just a dance, we're going to keep dancing, right? That's when when you really want to be worried, right? Because you're getting you're buying at a price where people ignore risk, ignore bad things could happen. When you talk to the investment teams at big pension funds and big pools of assets, they all understand this. Like you're. Like when you explain that to them, they all get that. They all get it. Okay. And then they say, we get it. But, you know, we do have a layman board, a layman trustee board that they that have don't to get it. Communicate that they're to. They're freaking out. This is not the time for us to take risks because they're reading scary headlines. So so that's, that's why it's so hard for a large pool of assets to act counter cyclically. Like in other words, to look at the, Na- the NASDAQ's 30% off its high. That's like historically, that's a pretty good buying opportunity. It's not the bottom, but it's definitely better than last year. (laughs) Way better than last year. But if you bring investment ideas related to that to a board of laymen, you know, people that are trustees because their uncle started the company or something, it's really hard to get them to see it that way, right? Yeah, they're going to say, do you not read the paper? Do you not realize the Fed's going to hike and we're going to have a recession next year? How can you be thinking about buying right now. So theoretically, that should be an advantage for the retail investor who's seen a few cycles and has nobody to answer to. And those people are probably out there. Oh, yeah. I mean, technically, you know, if you can make fast decisions, you have an advantage. Unfortunately, the data tells us most people who can make fast decisions, they make fast decisions that are wrong. <laughs> so <laughs> probably you should get at least an advisor to stop you from doing that. Fair enough. So All right. We want to do some China stuff. Matt, Matt Klein um, did this thing about COVID zero in China. And there's some wild numbers coming out of there. The change in industrial production in Shanghai year over year down 60 to it's insane, percent. Right? How is that possible? Not down 6%. It's like another zero. It's crazy. How is uh, that How is that possible? How, is that real? It's real because they literally say, "All right, everyone, stay home. Don't go to work." So, how did that not how did that not already clo- uh, cause a global recession because didn't they say like when China sneezes the world catches a cold? Uh, I mean, the global logistics and the inventory management has been phenomenal. We got to give those folks a lot of you know, credit like Given Amazon, what they're dealing with. yeah, you know, handling inventory, predicting inventory, predicting supply chain. We've done a phenomenal job of sort of minimizing that impact, hitting us immediately. Okay. When you talk to people in China, what do they say about still doing lockdowns in 2022? Like, are people really adhering to what the government's telling them, or is it like kind of half assed? So a few weeks ago, it was really bad. Yeah. Uh, but the government has now sort of started to shift its emphasis, right? Everything they're talking about is stabilized growth, stabilized GDP, be more pro-business, pro-growth. Uh, and they're willing to now find a new way to declare victory on sort of COVID containment, right? And again- you Declare victory when everybody has gotten it. Unfortunately, they're very <laughs> far away from that. So they're, they're, they're now looking for a, a different angle, right? Yeah. And it's, it's, you know, right now I think it's a, a lot more about saving face than the science of COVID containment. Yeah. Uh, right now they've sort of found new scapegoats, right? And part of it is, look, you know, local governments were over-reporting and over-testing because 
the money was being paid out of central government, not the local treasury. Now they say, look, all the costs go on you. And right. what they're seeing is local governments are starting to change their behaviors. They're not you know, mass testing of everyone. Uh, right. They also found that a lot of testing kits had a high false positive rate. Again, you know, uh, that's never yeah. good. <laughs> right. right. You can kind of understand why manufacturers would want high false positive testing rate, right? Because then you just sell more testing kits. Uh, so, you know, they, they, they're sort of blaming this out of control COVID containment on those two, you know, faults, uh, okay. fault points. And, and I think they're finding a face safe way to say, look, that's behind us. We're going to fix that. And they're going to be on a path of opening. Look, up. test less and you'll have less COVID. I mean, that's what we did here. Let's all keep it real. Yep. Uh, there's probably as much COVID around now as there was last year. The difference is everyone's using take-home tests rather than reporting somewhere for a test. And when you have a take-home test and you're positive, you stay home for three days. You don't call it in to the to the hotline and, and report it. That's yep. at least what I'm hearing and what I'm seeing. So that's kind of how the world is going to get past this. Is this going to be an ongoing problem for the global economy? Uh, what, what's happening with China's attempt to fight this? Or have we probably seen the most severe version of it? I think we've seen the worst of it. Like China okay. was like the one remaining stronghold of the zero COVID policy that really was slowing everyone down. I think we're now cross a point where everyone realized it doesn't matter how you want to talk about it, you know, what safe face way of dealing with this is. We are going to live with COVID and all the future variants and say, it's a flu, you know, you're going to catch it. No big deal. Jason, do you cover Chinese tech stocks? Uh, because I'm looking at Baidu and Baba and Tencent and I guess K-Web's the proxy that we look at. And is there just seller exhaustion? These things could like get a nice squeeze going on. Oh yeah. I mean, they are really, really cheap. So the only reason they're that cheap is you got to believe in two things, right? One is they'll get delisted and can't find another venue to relist, right? Uh, and that's a dramatic outcome, right? Because a lot of them are already dual listed in Hong Kong. And the other one is the Chinese government has to be really insane and say, for whatever reason, I just want to sort of punish our most successful, most profitable companies. What, what, can, you talk, can you walk us through why that, that had to be as severe as it seems to have been? Because these are arguably some of the most successful companies in the world, I thought China's stance toward those companies were like, look at our crown jewels. It's pretty aggressive. Look at our brilliant innovators. And it's almost as though they wanted to see a third to half of the market cap of these companies come out. A whole bunch of U.S. investors just kicked them out of their portfolio. Like, was this all by design or did did one idea get out of control and just feed on itself? What's your take on why that happened? There were a bunch of unfortunate things that was happening at the same time. Uh, part of it is a lot of these big techs have become outright monopolies, right? They were they were just so powerful, such a big part of the economy, such enormous employers, right. uh, and they were sort of making up their own rules. And they I got a little they, arrogant. They got a little arrogant. Okay. Uh, and a lot of them, I right, just imagine, like you know, Uber, right? Had constant battles with local regulators on, are these employees, should you be paying their social security yeah. or their contractors? And like, do you need to get a license? Yeah, because, we have that here. Yeah. E Elon Musk didn't get invited to the White House with the other EV companies because no unions at Tesla. Like this, we have that here too. Yeah, and okay. then so for China, those are just sort of bigger issues. Like, look, you know, you're, you're a Meituan, right? You're the biggest, you know, delivery, you're DD, you're the biggest sort of, you know, ride hailing. Ride hailing, And right. look, you're not paying these people anything, right? And then you're not paying into the system. So, you know, they, they made a, they, they tried to make an example out of these big firms. And obviously, you know, Alibaba, like if you're a merchant on Alibaba, uh, you can't be a merchant on our digital platform. And so the government's saying, like, yeah. that's, that's monopoly. And Jack Ma Jack talks Ma shit about the banks. And, which and, and of course, you know, like Jack Ma, I think. He like um, disappeared for a while. Uh, so he, he, he was put under house arrest, but part of it was they were saying, look, we don't understand anything about like what you're doing, right? Big data, uh, you know, the, the, the value of economy, explain it to us and help us regulate. And so yeah. in some ways it was sort of a good deal for him. Like he got to be in the room explaining to people, you know, who are going to make up the rules about how it should be done. So that wasn't so scary, but uh, Josh, you're right. Like, uh, if you're very, very outspoken in China, you're just going to draw unwanted attention, especially if you go hard at regulators. That's, I, that seems crazy to me to be in that position and want to do that. I guess he wants to be like Elon Musk. Yeah, it didn't go so well. Okay. well what was the Ant Group supposed to IPO? Oh, okay. So that is actually a great story, right? Like Ant Group, there you can't blame regulator, right? Like the Ant Group 
like financial when you when you look through it, right? It was just always going to blow up badly, right? It was going to IPO at like two hundred billion dollars in market valuation. Today they estimate it like it's probably worth twenty billion. Part well, of because- let's, let's back up. The Ant Group is like the fintech business that started within Alibaba. Is it like Correct. Square? Like it's payments. It's, it's everything. It's a mutual fund. Right. It's a money market fund. It's oh, yeah. banking. It's everything. They like, were saying it was going to be the biggest IPO other than Saudi Aramco of all time. Totally, right? I can't believe that didn't happen. And that's New York be- Stock Exchange? Oh, yeah. I mean, that was, uh, I think it was going to be Hong Kong. Oh, yeah. I thought, all right. I thought it was going to be Hong Kong, Hong Kong and yeah. then eventually New York. That's right. right. Whatever. It was going to be dual listed just because it was going to take so much capital. Yeah. And the thing was, they then they realized, look, you're selling mutual funds, you're selling life insurance, you're doing like, all these things are heavily regulated everywhere in the world, and especially heavily regulated in China. Just because you say you're an app, right, doesn't mean you can do all this without <laughs> getting a license first. Right. And then once you get the license, you got to demonstrate capital adequacy, right, because you're selling financial products, right? These all have huge, huge balance sheet requirements, and they didn't have any of that. Yeah. And so they, you know, regulators just, look, we can't let you go forth with this because once you sort of float yourself and a lot of retail individuals jump in the top range of valuation, and then we come in and say, look, there are all these unsettled issues, right? It's it's the buyers, right? It's the people who jump in IPO who can get screwed. But Jack but Jack Ma was being very flippant in the face of that. At the, at those things all happen at the same time. Yeah, he, he drew attention of the regulators. And of course, you know, Again, the regulators didn't always know what they were trying to approve, but when he drew extra attention, right, then you got the top people looking at, okay, so what's, you know, let's take a look. Okay. Another company that that should have listened and didn't um, was Didi. Yeah. Probably the most disastrous <laughs> Chinese, uh, high-profile Chinese tech IPO of the last few years. Oh, yeah. So they... They're told not to go public Correct. in the U.S. Like Ant Financial, they were told not to go but public. But then they say, we're doing it anyway. They do a roadshow and they do it. The stock, what a disaster. And from filing to listing, it took them like seven days. Yeah. Unheard of. Yeah. Because they were just like, let's get it out the door and it'll be fine. And and you kind of think about like what management team thinks about, hey, let me float shares immediately and get liquidity. And right? that's their it's country of domicile, selection. not the U.S. Yeah. They do business in China. Yeah, is this bad? Down 88%? In the so hottest? wait, so what happened to this? So they came public and the next day, like China banned their app? Yeah. Basically said, you can't even operate here? Yeah, because so-, so <laughs> Look at like, the day so after the IPO, this, look at this. So this story <laughs> behind it is, is is hilarious, right? Like this actually all happened. Again, everything how, ties how, back we, to Elon we don't, Musk. We don't really know the story behind yeah, it. Yeah, so this actually goes back to a Tesla crash in China that got investigated, like all crashes. And they discover, wait, a Tesla records everything inside the car and everything around the car. And then streams it back to the US for analysis, right? To help yeah. with autonomous driving and all that. And they go, wait. A lot of Chinese it's like surveil- people. It's like surveillance. Yeah. And so right. immediately there's like this, this announcement from the Chinese government, Chinese officials are not allowed to ride in a Tesla, right? Because right. everything you're doing in the car around it's the car recorded. gets recorded. Right. And then they go, wait, DD does the same thing, right? And that's like the biggest, you know, right hailing. Now, if DD is Chinese and only the Chinese government has access to data, they don't really care. But what if it lists in the US, most of the shares are owned by American public pensions, does it become an American company? Do Americans now have full access to yeah. 600 million, you know, records on, on on Chinese, you know, citizens? Right. Then they go, wait, before we let you do this, we got to make up rules around who owns that data. Right. And then Didi freaked out and say, well, we're going to gun it. We're going to- So Jason, ourselves. this thing came public at $75 billion in market cap. Now it's under 10. It, I mean, it's it's breathtaking. Um, so, right. So, so look, it makes sense that there'd be some sensitivity. We don't just allow our stuff to happen overseas and let's see what, what happens. But what I wanted to ask you was like from a U.S. investor's perspective, and I know you talk to U.S. investors every day, when we see something like that, we're not thinking about it from the Chinese side, obviously. We're thinking of it like, what if I bought that thing and lost 80% of my money? Yeah. So as somebody who's investing money in Chinese companies – how do you uh, talk to investors about like that? Yeah, that is a real risk, yeah. but that risk is worth taking because of what the opportunity is. So how, how do you do that? So Josh, that's a huge part, which is obviously China is risky, right? Like no one is telling you China is as safe as the US, right? right. Like no one's saying that. Right? It's risky. So it's a matter of, are you being paid enough to take that risk? Okay. And you certainly don't want to be concentrated in making one big bet into one company because the fact it's risky means 
one company you know, could fall 80% because of policy interruption, right? Yeah. And so you got to broadly diversify because you're not betting on one Chinese company. Policy interruption is like a euphemism for a CEO running afoul of Beijing or some, something like that. Yeah, right. something unlucky could happen. By the way, close at the highest, highest close in the month. Woo! Super bullish. Okay, All go right. on. And, and so you want to be diversified because I think what you're betting on is you're betting on, okay, you know, that market's going to improve in quality so the valuation multiple might increase as it becomes more liquid, more international, right? As it becomes a bigger part of the MSCI index. Uh, and you're betting on, hey, look, it's got a GDP growth that's 5%, 6% on average, at least for a few more years. And that's got to translate into corporate earnings growth. So you're betting on that. So instead of like trying to pick the one winner and financial or DD, right? You want to be broadly diversified. So right. you're participating everywhere. The funny thing is we think of growth stocks in the U.S. as tech companies. And that's true, right? Because everyone, everything else is kind of brick and mortar, kind of boring. But in China, like everything's a growth stock, right? I mean, you're growing out GDP Even a brick and mortar business is growing because yeah. of the speed that the economy is Yeah, growing. like if you're selling air conditioner, right? A lot of people are yeah. buying air conditioners for the first time. That's a really boring thing in the U.S., but it's a fast-growing household appliance in China. What do you say to people who say, I'm getting all the China exposure I need via the S&P 500, given like most U.S. companies, global companies, are getting a lot of future growth from China, or at least are planning to? You're definitely getting some, but only some, right? Like, sure, Apple, right? But right. Uh, like, so the, the, like China mints a lot of new billionaires, the richest dude in China. They're not all tech guys, right? Like the current richest dude in China is the guy who sells water. Really? Yeah. What's his name? Uh, God, what, what's what's his company? It's a utility. Uh, no, they 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 sell beverage uh, bottled water. Yeah, bottled water. That's the wealthiest man in China right okay. now. Yeah, and the last guy was a guy who sold hot pot. Right, so it's a restaurant chain. It's got like four thousand chain okay. stores. Okay. Right, so these are like growth areas you don't think about, and they're certainly not represented by sort of the S and P five hundred. Right? These are like really, really sort of local stuff, and if you want to participate in that. Um, you're gonna have to take some risk and go onshore. Okay, you're not you're not gonna get enough of that exposure from a U.S. portfolio, in other words. Yeah, uh, Coca Cola is not gonna capture enough of that. <laughs> uh, what's your read on the housing market? U.S. U.S. What, uh, do you, what, do you, what do you think's What do you think's going on there? Obviously, it peaked. It's it, it definitely peaked. I, I think right now you're you're experiencing like stage number one, which is things are gonna get really slow. Right, you want to sell. Michael's and a landlord, so don't make him too nervous. But go, but go on. Great. If, if you rent at your stuff, you know inflation's on your side, right? But if you somehow are too geared up and you got to sell your uh, sell your properties because you didn't refinance at a lower rate, a lot refinanced, in, um, then it's going to be hard to sell. Let's right? run. Let's run through some charts. So Bill McBride did this thing, the Housing Affordability Price Index x the the uh, housing bubble. It's as high as it's been since the early '90s. This is a combination of obviously interest rates, just general home prices. But 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 we're starting to see finally that. You know how like there was a house on the market and there was fifty bids at yeah, added and above cash it's insane. Bids. Yeah. No so now so now it's starting to come in a little bit. I forget who this is from, but uh, we're seeing twenty three percent of new listings went into contract immediately, which is by the way still insane. One out of five houses get sold immediately, but that's down from a peak of like thirty something percent in early December. And finally, 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 we're starting to see more price drops than any time since 2019. 5% of listings on a four-week rolling average are, are are dropping. And Josh, I'm seeing this all over our town. Yeah, Michael and I live in the same town and the real estate market looked like every other suburban real estate market. It was like absolutely on fire. Everything was a bidding war. Cash bids, people's parents, like the buyer's <laughs> parents paying. Now I'm seeing a listing and then like two weeks later, I'm down seeing 50. a price, automatic price drop. Yeah. Uh, down 50 grand, like yeah. immediately. And, and and that can't be surprising, right? That's like your cost, cost of financing has gone up. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So the, so the Fed is the Fed is still very powerful and can make things change really quickly. Oh, yeah. Because uh, I feel like the mortgage rate was the first thing to respond in the real economy to the Fed's rhetoric, even before the stock market. Yep. And so I think there's no question that the Fed is powerful, just that we don't realize that what it gives, it can take away, right? We love it when it's giving sort of subsidized cheap cost, cheap, cheap cost of capital to us. Right. But you know, when it's taking that away, now now we're now we got issues with. Here's uh, here's Mark Zandi. I think he's from Moody's. Yeah, Moody's Analytics chief economist Mark Zandi. 
Quote, the housing market has peaked. Everything points to a rolling over of the housing market. In terms of home sales, they're falling sharply. Housing demand is coming down fast. Home price growth will go flat here pretty quickly. We will see price declines in a significant number of markets. But how significant will the price declines be? Well, I, I, don't, gonna, I don't think they're going to they fall that much. I was going to ask you, given the tailwind of demography and given it's doubtful the Fed is like trying to cause a recession, is there enough – push and pull that we can have home prices come down, become more affordable, but not repeat the crash of the mid 2000s. No, that's not going to happen. There's no crash. I mean, because most people like, like Michael, like yourself, you refinance, you locked in cheap, right? There's no carrying costs, right? It's not like you, you're on this, you know, no money down floating that's rate thing. That's and credit scores are still super high. Yeah. I was going to yeah. say the buyers have been highly qualified. Yeah. This, this, so, uh, so I don't think there there is a sort of, sort of deleveraging crisis there. All you're going to have is, look, things are going to get a little less a liquid. Little less. It's harder to yeah. sell. You're not going to have people overbidding, and the price is going to come down as a result still, of that. There's still so many people my age that are trying to buy their first house that were priced out. There's still so many of them lined up to come in. So, yeah. Prices will cool off, but I don't think they're going to like drop dramatically. Oh yeah, I don't think there's going to be this sort of speculative deleveraging. No. Uh, that that no. sort of you know we saw. Nobody panic sells their house, yeah. right? These are not speak, vacation speak, properties. Speak for yourself. <laughs> um, I, I, yeah, I, I kind of right. I kind of feel like it's actually on balance. It's a good thing if the value of the boomers' houses drops by ten percent, but the millennials can actually buy them. It's like, a great thing. So, so balance, it'll be, that's what it it'll be 10% happen. off the highs and still up 30% from 2019. You know, so we're just cooling off a little bit. All right, let's let's talk EM broadly and uh, earnings per share growth in emerging markets. So th- this is you, and I'll, I'll let you react to yourself. <laughs> emerging markets have been underperforming developed markets for some time now. I mostly blame you. Everything that guy just said is bullshit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> meaningfully over the last five years and even more so versus U.S. stocks, which have been on fire. That put EM at much more attractive valuations going into 2022. As developed markets economic growth slows, investors are likely to look to EM as one place you might still find fast growth. One of the interesting things we found in our research is that the EM growth story really depends on how you define growth and not all countries give you access to the growth that matters to investors. Explain what you mean by that. Yeah, so the big mystery for people who, you know, overweight EM was the GDP growth never translated into stock market returns, right? Like the last 15 years, EM grew, grew faster than the U.S. from a GDP perspective. That guy, what was the guy with the bricks? O'Neill. G- yeah. Jim O'Neill. Is he that because li- companies lied. weren't IPOing? That's right. It's because you can't buy a slice of Brazil. You can't buy a slice you can't of buy payroll. GDP. Yeah, you can't buy GDP, right? What you can buy is you can buy listed companies. And what we discover is the average company in emerging markets, right? You take out like China, um, the average company in the emerging market actually has declining earnings per share growth when Why? the GDP is growing. Why? And it's because those markets, it's only like the gigantic state-owned enterprise, the resource-based state-owned enterprises that list, right? So you're talking about, you know, Petrobras in in, in Brazil, right? You're talking about Luke Oil in, uh, in, in Russia. And those are not terribly efficient, a lot of political intervention, and all sorts of and problems. they dominate the EM indices. They, they dominate their- how big they are. That's right. They, they okay. dominate their local market indices. And other, 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 they don't have like a vibrant, you know, VC sort of ecosystem to incubate companies so they become unicorns and list, right? So, you know, most firms just can't list in So, in Jason, EM. there are EM small cap funds, though. It's not as though those have outperformed. No, uh, it's because, again- it's really hard and expensive to list. So most of the mom and pop companies that are pri- that stay private don't list because it's not worth their time. Right? Not of liquidity. So they are the recipients of the growth of those markets and outside investors just can't access them. That's right. And so okay. when you think about EM, right, you just can't buy EM growth. China happens to be a bit of a weird outlier because China, I think, got lucky in that the VC from the US all went over to China, right? They got a taste of the Alibaba Tiger. and then- and then before you know it, right, they're funding everything, right? They 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 they, they really built, you know, ten cents, right? May Twan and all these great companies. Uh, the 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 book uh, by Sebastian Malby about venture does a whole thing on China, yeah. on the venture guys going to yeah. China. This chart is freaking weird. It really is. I don't know if I've ever seen anything like it. We're looking at on one axis, you've got mean real per capita GDP growth, 
yep. mostly positive, all positive, and real earnings per share growth, mostly negative. This it's is so crazy, bizarre. right? So hold on. So India has mean real earnings per share growth of less than 5%, while its GDP growth is like 5%. Yeah. So that's almost, it's almost like a stock market failure. But look at South Korea. Do these companies just suck at, at, at governance or capital allocation? What is, what is this? Both. Both. South Korea had f- almost 4% real capita GDP growth and negative 6% EPS growth. How, literally, how is that possible? So these are governance failures, right? Governance failures. Okay, right? so like, do these managers we need, we need get better? John, John Malone needs to go to South Korea. <laughs> no, but what has to happen for this to change? Like, in, like what are you telling people is the opportunity then? If, if that's the state of EM stocks. So like if you're a global investor, obviously you can't go to South Korea and just change governance here, right? That it is what it is. Then you kind of go, okay, I got to focus on growth metrics that matters to me, right? Like GDP growth doesn't matter. Right? So you what gotta, does? You got to look at EPS growth. Like, you know, markets where listed corporations actually grow, it means they have good governance, right? They face sensible cost of capital. The market does enough to differentiate good companies from bad companies. So bad companies can't stay around forever and destroy shareholder values. Right. So you want to start your universe that way. Rather than looking at GPA, uh, EPA, uh, sorry, GDP growth, you look at EPS. Right? You so look you're at- not weighting a portfolio by how fast the country is growing or how large it is. That's right. You're, you're trying to weight a portfolio by adding companies with real earnings per share growth. That's right. That's J- a huge departure from the MSCI indices right right off the bat. Yep. Okay. Jason, let me ask you this. So this chart goes from 96 to 2019. So this is spanning spanning a long time. So South Korea, for example, I'm guessing the market's up quite a bit since yeah. 1996. Does, this, does that mean that they're so top heavy that just the giant companies are contributing all of the market cap growth? Like what? So it, it, it's a few companies that, that dominate their indexes and that that's driving, but it, that's driving sort of um, the stock stock market appreciation. A lot of it is valuation. They've they've experienced. What's South know, Korea? It's like electronics and, and Samsung, automo- Samsung. automobiles. Samsung. You got Samsung and you got uh, Kia, Kia Daewoo. Yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, these big tables that uh, that sort of dominate their economy. Yeah. Uh, but most of the average firms in that economy suffer. They can't get fair cost of capital. So didn't all the uh, CEOs and and uh, CFOs of these companies at go Samsung to- went to jail? <laughs> No, no, no. Well, yeah, no, I know there's, we have our share of scandals too, but like just broadly speaking, globally, didn't all these people go to Harvard Business School and Wharton and like go back to their countries and say, okay, here's how it's done? Or or is it not quite like that? I mean, it is like that, right? But what they learned is, yeah, it's much better to be a CEO at a company with poor governance than a CEO at a company with great governance, right? Because oh, if you're a CEO- personal comp. Yeah, conflict <laughs> okay. of interest, right? Got it. Okay. Is that changing? Is it getting better? Or is it still where, where it's been for a long time? For most of EM, it, it doesn't change. You know, governance So that's is the opportunity for you, though, because you can build investment products that are looking for the right thing. Yeah, I mean, ESG in EM is hugely valuable, especially the G part. That's interesting. You get that right, it will add returns to your portfolio. Now, when you have a few superstar companies that are doing things the right way and have high ESG scores and start to outperform the local market, don't the other companies look at that and say, let's get our shit together? Look how much money they're making. Again, you know, back to your example, right? People think about what's best for me, yeah. not always what's best for my company. And if you aren't incentivized by stock options and stock shares, you kind of go, hey, look, if my company sort of is a zombie company, but I get to fly in fancy I'm private jets, pay myself, yeah, yeah. I don't really care. Okay. It's it's interesting how, how – all right, so can you find enough stocks to buy? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, I mean, in every country or only in some countries or how does that work? Uh, only in some countries, right? Like if you, if you, I mean, obviously there are going to be a few companies, you know, in India and South Korea that, that are printing positive EPS growth, but that's, that's the outlier, not the norm. And you don't want to be in the market where the norm is, is against you, right? Cause you're swimming upstreams in that case, right? Your people told me that you guys are building indices or your own index products or what, what do you tell us about what you're doing there? Yeah, so we, we struck up a partnership with uh, with Wilshire, okay. uh, with their index arm, and what we're trying to help them do is they take all these new insights and build like the next generation of sort of factor indices, right? The traditional factor indices, like okay, you know, do some value, some low vol, some small cap, and right, yeah, book yeah, to market yeah, stuff right. that comes out of you know MBA textbooks, and we really know a lot more today, like you know what works in which markets, why. And so the next generation is sort of taking a lot of what we've been talking about, right? Like 
the things that really matter in investing, stuff that are So like an earnings growth index, for example, or an yep. ESG index? Yep. Okay. All right. And then you're going to build investment products based on those? Are you going to license them? What, what What's your plan? Yeah. So, you know, we love the index chassis, right? Because it's transparent. It leads to cheap product, uh, right? ETF, index tracker fund. So we're going to sort of jam all the IP into an index chassis, make them available. So ETF providers, uh, you know, index fund houses can produce fairly transparent and cost-effective products. Exist, the existing indices, I, I don't want you to bash anybody, but like the MSCI EM, there's... It's not useful really to anybody because it's very one size fits all. All of these countries are different and it's very top heavy and there's a lot of state owned enterprises or in name only state owned enterprises. Right. So so you're just saying like this asset class does have value, but you have to know how to weight it or, or you won't capture yeah, it. Yeah, I think you want to put a little more thinking, a little more IP into index design. Right? The fact that, you know, Index should be dumb. I think that's an oversold thing. That might be true for S&P 500 because market's pretty efficient. So, you know, even if you sort of just price away, cap away, you're going to be all right. Right. But in markets, you know, like EM where, look, the average company destroys value, right? You can't just sort of price away and say that's that's going to work. Um, insider trading and NFTs this week. <laughs> what do you think about this? Can you, can you commit securities... Fraud in something that's not yeah, well, security. This, well, this was a this was a big deal in the NFT community. Not that like I'm part of the community, but you know, at the time, right? This was uh, headlines all over the place. So the last sto- September this, is when it first. The came story to life. is that one of the senior employees at OpenSea mm-hmm. was buying NFTs before they listed them on the homepage, which is you know not legal. <laughs> Fun running. Well, he was the guy that was responsible. Actually, for actually, on the I don't know the legality of this. It's let's just say it's unethical. So now we're learning that it's illegal because they are. It's illegal because it's wire fraud, meaning he's conducting a fraud utilizing the internet or the telephone. So what's racketeering? Not this. Is that is that mobster stuff? Uh, Racketeering is like uh, I go up and down. What are we on 40th Street? I walk into Chipotle. I say five hundred dollars a month every month on the first or I'm worried something terrible might happen. Right. We should do that. It's called a protection racket. One example of racketeering. What this is, is it's not a security, but it doesn't need to be. Like, insider, there's no such law against insider trading. Like, that's not a law in the books. The law is against um, committing either securities fraud or wire fraud. Wire fraud is any fraud that you pull off by means of using the telephone or the internet. Okay, so they did. So, so he was he was front-running the customers. So he, Right. So he had the power – to make an NFT worth two to three X what it was worth the day before mm. by putting it on the homepage of OpenSea, which but so, is the biggest but so marketplace does for that, NFTs. Does that, that doesn't necessarily mean that these are securities. It could, securities it's are not relevant. They're, right. they're calling it a fraud. They're a fraud is a fraud. And it's not, uh, it doesn't matter if it's a security. They're saying that he committed fraud against the buyers mm. by buying it right. before them. Right. So, or, or again, excuse me, he committed fraud against the seller. Because if you are the he person- He bought it cheaper. Right. If you're the person yeah. that sells him that NFT on Tuesday and then on Wednesday, he makes the value go up by triple because he puts it on the homepage, you were defrauded as the set, right? Yep. So it doesn't matter if it's security or not. Um, it's interesting, though, to see regulators uh, very quickly figure out that these aren't new scams. They're just old scams with new products or new techniques. Digital scams. Di- digital scams. So with that being said, how many NFTs can I put you down for? <laughs> are, are, you, are you in this market as an as a anime fan? Does any of this stuff interest you or not really from an art perspective? I've been trying to convince my wife in the museum she works at, the yeah. Boston Museum of Fine Arts, uh, to do NFTs of their like, you know, vast collection. So to sell NFTs on the market for yeah, people because that are fans they, of the they art. They literally could say, hey, look, you could own a limited, you know, 100 uh, limited edition of a Monet they have, right? And, and so, you know, what's museums most, are, are the underfunded. Most, they need the money. What's the most priceless, what's the most valuable piece of art at the Boston Museum of Fine Art? Wow. I wouldn't know, but I got to guess. It's either one of the Van Goghs or one of the Monet. So, Jason, yeah. this is this is one of the, like, uh, big NFT collections. It's called Azuki. Have mm-hmm. you ever heard of this one? Ooh. The floor is the floor is twelve ETH, so it's like not inexpensive. So what's that like? Uh, Twenty something thousand dollars. Twenty five hundred times twelve. Well, it's two thousand now, so almost twenty twenty five grand for the cheapest one. Mm-hmm. That's ten thousand of them. Okay, uh, I thought this was interesting. I think we're going to see so many more 
cases where the regulators or or the uh, state's attorneys general will get involved. Like it's going to be a feeding frenzy because there's so much money here. Like people have made billions Stupid of money. dollars and they have done it in a way that's not fully transparent. And so I think if you're uh, law enforcement in any way or a regulator, you have to be looking at this as like – this is where I'm going to really make the biggest impact. Uh, um, there's been a lot of crazy scams. Just token drops and <sighs> and even like the the brokerage firms, what what tokens or coins they choose to list, who knew about it beforehand, yeah. what did they do? It doesn't matter that they're not securities. What matters is that people that had information took advantage of it and they maybe should not have. Yeah. And it's up to a jury to decide, does it matter if it's a security or not? Well, so we, we saw this today. This is like tangential. But uh, according to the CF, to the CFTC, these are just allegations, of course. Uh, Gemini lied to regulators about giving market, maker, market makers rebates. So definitely much more to come on that over the next couple of weeks. So, right. So it's another example of like something that in regular securities market is supposed to be transparent. Who even knows if it has to be in that market? And but just if by, they decide that it does, by definition, maybe not with this stuff, but just generally speaking, the 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 trouble only seems to unearth, be unearthed during bear markets. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, I bet you the regulators were terrified, even though they know they should look at this. They're terrified that, well, you know, a lot of people are making money in this. Maybe there's something to it we don't understand. I don't want to go out there and embarrass myself and stop a good thing. So it's only when prices fall and things blow up, they go, okay, well, I knew that was a problem. You know, now I can go look at it. I think some of that is the regulators also sort of reacting to the price collapse and sort of taking, uh, you know, you know, I think taking some solace that they they actually might know what they're doing uh, and stepping in now. Because enough, you- enough money has been lost yeah. that they'll have the public on their side. That's right. Because before that, people are going to say, hey, you're stopping innovation. You don't know what you're talking about. Now it's harder to say that. Yep. Now it's like, hey, you scammed me. Uh, and that's, I think it's it. I think it's almost going to become an easy way to get the public on your side, given how much money has been lost. Yeah. So I think I think that's exactly I mean, right. Just just like you know, I think what two years ago, maybe a year and a half ago, when the Chinese government came out and say, look, there's there's no more sort of you know Bitcoin or cryptocurrency transaction. Everyone was against that, right? It's like ah, you know, this central planning, this against innovation. It's oh, people funny. who don't know what the hell they're talking about, trying to regulate. And of course, now they go, okay, all right, well, maybe they know what they're talking about. How much about. money did the Chinese government save the Chinese people by oh, opting out of uh, crypto? Huge. Like, like Bitcoin was like, what, like 70% of all the mining and everything and the transactions was, was in China. In China. Yeah. yeah. Do you have like a strong Bitcoin opinion or not really? Not really. I, mean, I know I, there's no way to really value it from the way that you typically look at markets. Hey, it's a store value, right? I, I think of it as more collectible art. Uh, store values are like that, right? Like, you know, gold. Like, gold doesn't pay a dividend. It has no cash flow for you to discount. It's belief-based. It's got value because we all decide it's got value. And I think Bitcoin's got that status, so it could hang around as an alternative store of value, another gold. Uh, The other lesser currencies, I I don't think they'll make it through this one. (laughs) Okay. Yeah, it's going to be tough to make the case that there needs to be 50 versions of Bitcoin. Yeah. And, like, sure, Bitcoin, you can't print more, right? But if you can print, like, Bitcoin 2, Bitcoin 3, like a bunch of other crypto. That's right? always that doesn't been, help, That's right? always been my argument against it is like I understand there's only 21 million coins, but then like there could be 21 million of another yeah, coin. That's, yeah. kind of, that's a bullshit argument. Well, so far so good. I mean there's way too many coins now. Well, that's true. Okay, that's true. so. Uh, all right, let's let's do favorites and then we'll let everybody get out of here. It looks like it's about to pour. Uh, uh, great. <laughs> I don't know how far you have to go, oh. but the sky is now black outside. I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'm going to start. Did you watch uh, the Norm, Norm Nothing Special yet? Not yet. Don't ruin it for me. So, is it good? He's probably... Tell me, Nor, uh, Norm MacDonald, the mm. comedian who just passed. So okay. he's one of the... I can't even think of who else could talk into a, a Zoom camera for an hour and keep your attention. Um, So it was... It was great seeing Norm. I don't think it was like hilarious. It's so hard without an audience. You know what I mean? Like, but also he's dying. Well, <laughs> but no, but that You're part, watching it and you know he just died. No, but so it's hard to I'm laugh. just judging it on the content itself. It's impossible to make people laugh when you're just talking into a camera, right? But there was some really funny stuff. But anyway, the interesting thing was that after the show, uh, Letterman, Chappelle, Molly Shannon, Conan, Sandler, and Spade were sitting at a, at a, uh, on a couches talking about him. 
And that was really neat to see. Is that and part of the special? That was like that was like the twenty minutes uh, after the special was over. They sat around for twenty minutes just talking about him, talking about the special. And Sandler is just just see he's just he's so Adam Sandler. Just seeing him in his element, like he just is a caricature of himself. It was, it was pretty awesome. Anyway, uh, I would I would, if, if you're gonna, if you're a Norm fan, you got to watch it. I'm gonna I'm gonna get I'm gonna get to it. Uh, what are you reading? What are you watching? Any favorites uh, that the audience should be aware of? Last week I saw. Uh, Everything, everywhere, all at once. Oh, oh I, heard such show good I heard such good things. Tell me about, about it. it. It was fantastic, right? It is took a while to get into. Is that from Korea? No, it was, uh, I think, like three independent producers. I think they may have been, been European. I've okay. heard amazing things. So yeah. tell us. Super creative, right? This It's about this, like, Chinese lady who runs a laundromat, right? In a bit of a loser in her life, right? Like, you know loveless marriage her, her daughter hates her right yeah um, but then you know she was chosen to sort of travel the multiverse and connect with all different versions of herself and basically in that process right you're able to live through had she made a different choice in her life she could become this and then mm. so that was sort of fascinating way to to get one to think about sort of making different choices in life what could that lead to oh uh, there and are so many versions of me that are probably better than this one in the multiverse. I'm with that. No, this is about as good as it could have gone. This, yeah. this is the yeah, best case. Yeah. <laughs> the, this will be your old, the, the yeah. alpha verse, yeah. according to their language. Michael right. thinks this is as good as it This is your ceiling. Come on. Fine. Who are you, who are you kidding? Did you see this movie yet? This seems like it would be up. No, right I, up your alley. I've heard of it, but I haven't seen it. Did you see it's it? I saw the trailer awesome. for it. It looks pretty cool. Yeah. Oh, wait a minute. Obviously, my favorite thing is was Top Gun. Oh, my God. Oh, we didn't even Oh, get my it. God. Yeah. Tell, you why? seen it? It's incredible. I saw it. I saw it. Did you see it I, I've been dying, right? I did mean, you love the I, 80s one, like the original? I did. You know, okay. I, I, I saw it when I was 12, yeah. and I mean, I almost want to join the Navy, okay? Yeah, yeah, you yeah. have to go to the theater. It was so loud. It, it was so effective. The the last third, like the, you know, the climax was so good. I thought it was one of the best movies I've ever seen in a theater. And we sat right in front of the speakers, and our seats were like rumbling <laughs> when the planes were flying. And uh, I loved all the acting in it. it. Was really good. So they made that movie two years ago and sat yeah, on it. Yeah, Can you believe that? When I when good we choice. left, I said, I said to my friend, I was like, "Was that like one of the best movies you've ever seen in theater? Like, am I, like the over, like, am I am I like going nuts? I feel like that was incredible. I think it was. I think it was a better movie than the than the I first mean, one. Yes, by by a lot. Because technically, they could do so much more now than they could have right. back then. Yeah, it's not a fair comparison, but yeah, it was a lot better. They had cameras in like the real jet fighter planes. Cameras in the cockpits. All right, now like, I, this got, not, I got to go see it, it tonight. It was so good. It was it was sick. Uh, the Val Kilmer stuff was a little tough to watch. Yeah, I'm surprised he was in it. So you know the story? What's going on with him? He's dying, right? Yeah. Like he, he basically lost his entire. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah, so they dub him. Well, they have they make they write that into the movie. No, so, no, no, that's his voice. No, no, he had to type onto a screen for Maverick to be able to communicate with him. But he's like an at a very highly placed admiral in the navy but they have him dying. And uh, then like at the end of the scene, they have him like try to talk, but it's not, it's not really his voice because he really can't. And that was, that was tough. The, the reason that was so tough for me, not just Top Gun. Willow. One of my earliest memories of seeing a movie was a movie called Real Genius. You know oh, what? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, he's like a teenager in that movie. That's I didn't know he was in that film. It's a, hi it's a high school for the gifted. Uh -huh. And he's yeah, one of the main characters in the movie. I saw that movie. So, I didn't connect. That's him. Okay. So like, I just think about him being sixteen and me being seven yeah. or eight and watching that movie, and it's hard for me to accept. It's also crazy that we're that to see old. the juxtaposition of Val Kilmer, like you know, dying, know. and and Tom Cruise on top of the world. But this this is crazy, right? Because back then they were the same age, right? They're all two most handsome guys and, in the world, and, and now Tom Cruise still looks the same, right? Yeah, and I, there's yeah. Val. Yeah. It's sick how how good Tom Cruise looks. He's, yeah. We looked it's at how he's 59 it's years ridiculous. old. But speaking of Willow, I think Disney is remaking. That was my favorite movie as a child. That and the Never Ending Story. Doing it for Disney Plus. Disney Plus. Um, the kid Who's in playing Willow? Top Gun Two, Miles Teller. He was great. Outstanding. Phenomenal. Jennifer Connelly's outstanding. Yeah, it was great. It was um, so good. Yeah, the, I lo I loved every second of it. Um, all right, I have two. Do you know about the Museum of American Finance? Mm. They got a museum. It's it's downtown. Oh. It's in Manhattan. Oh, we've never been. We spoke about it years ago. I I was there like once in my life, and we always I always mean to, I don't even know if it's open because of COVID or whatever. Anyway, they do a monthly magazine, uh -huh. and they hire amazing like writers, mostly professors, to do like a feature article. The new issue came out this morning. It's free. You could just subscribe to it on 
line. It's like museumofamericanfinance.org or something. Uh, the new issue, the feature story is a professor from Harvard writing about how capitalism came to be hmm. and how informed it's been by religion. And it's oh. just out, it's just okay. so outstanding, so well done. So for people that are interested yeah, in digital? economics, yeah, digital. Oh, that's awesome. It's a PDF. You can read the whole issue digitally. The feature article, though, is just about like why we believe in what we believe about how to invest, how to run a company, and how much of that actually came from religion and not really from economics. Religion. Uh, really yeah, it's really cool. It's it's great. So I highly recommend that. And then I was gonna I was gonna throw out uh, I was gonna throw out uh, We Own This Town on HBO City. We Own the City. Holy shit, is that good? Great, great. Right. So if you're a fan of The Wire, it's David Simon and um, George Pelicanos and a lot of the actors from The Wire come back as different characters. But it's the same thing. It's Baltimore. It's drug dealing. It's police corruption. It's John Bernthal throwing 97,000 miles an hour. He was so good. Yeah, it's incredible. Have you watched that yet, Duncan? No, I haven't. What it have you been so, doing? You I've, seen I've lived in I've lived in Baltimore, and so I, and I never watched like The Wire. You can't or, revisit you know, the best part. Yeah, maybe now. It's maybe six now. episodes. It's a miniseries. It's only six. Okay, it was so it. so good. Yeah, I watched Stranger Things. Sorry. Stranger Things season four. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I didn't see season three. Do I have to? Uh, I didn't care for season three that much, but the the new season. But I like, could I just good. start it? I think so. Like, could I skip from one to four? I mean, you would be pretty <laughs> confused, but I think I think it could work. All right. I have I have one for you. Can I skip? Uh, I never watched the original Top Gun. Can I just watch the new one? Skip it. Don't skip, worry about skip it. Skip Top Gun. Right. Go, to, go to Maverick. Don't worry about it. Go straight to the new one, yeah. but go to go in theaters. Okay. All right. Uh, let's wrap up. You guys did a great job this week. Thanks, John, Nicole, Duncan. Jason. Jason. Congratulations on uh, one full year of the Compound and Friends. We will be back next week. Yeah, Jason, you killed it. Thank you so much for coming. Wow, thanks for having me. We really, really appreciate all your insights. Where can people follow you if they want to hear more? I follow. I read your stuff on LinkedIn. Is that where you post? LinkedIn's the place. LinkedIn's the place, right? I haven't quite figured out how to use Twitter. I am just very verbose. I can't make Twitter work for me. All right, me. it's Jason Shu, H-S-U, on LinkedIn. His stuff is great. I read everything that he puts out. Thank you so much because you have fun. Yeah, no, this is you great. Do, you want to do this again sometime? Yeah. Okay, how's next Wednesday? <laughs> no? We'll let you come up with some new insights first, and then we'll have you come back. Is that good? Yeah. All right. Jason, you're the man. We appreciate it. Congratulations on Raliant. Thank and you, thank you. good luck with the new indices that you're launching, and keep us posted. Absolutely. We definitely want to hear more. Okay, make sure that you write us a review. For God's sake, <laughs> if you love the show and you want more of the show, the best way that you can help us is to write a review, iTunes, Spotify, and even financial Yelp, and Yelp. financial. Oh, no. <laughs> Just please and write. Share us, with your friends. Share with your friends. Write us a good review. Thank you guys for listening all year. We'll be back next week. Like and subscribe. And remember, I don't shop.com, Twenty five percent off through Sunday night. We'll see you next week. Bye.